Hey everybody, it's Beak again, and I have another flame smoke action expression link tutorial, and it evolves around a basic concept. Well, one sort of quick example, and one rather complicated contraption, which involves not just linking, but expressions, and this machine here will take an area and it'll zoom it into the center of the screen and out toward the camera. Whereas this example here is just sort of highlighting the benefits of linking your axis position to your resize position. Which brings me to my point. I have an action set up here and in it I have a, a track which I've tracked to uh, this dude's eyeball and I have a resize node and I have linked as you can see here I have linked the X position of the axis uh, in the setup called iPoke to the crop boxes position in X. And I've done the same for Y. Um, it, it doesn't work if you copy them like entire position. You have to do explicit X and Y copy and link. However, once you do that, uh, you will see that you know as I have tracked this little kind of, kind of a cutout now uh, to this dude's eye. It allows me to go in here and do like an extended by cubic warp. For lack of anything better to do, I just made this guy's eye big and swollen. You know, I figured, oh look, what if your what if your brief was to give this guy a black eye because you know makeup was having a bad day or something wasn't happening? The advantage of doing it this way with a grid warper or extended by cubic, as we like to call them is uh, you, you get to multi-layer. So if you had a black layer and a blue layer, maybe a blood layer or, or, or whatever it is, you, you could theoretically feed the same uh, tracked cutout into your same action and start stacking these guys and you get you know blend and transparency and other things that aren't available to you in the distort node. Plus if you look at the distort node you might think my how, how much you've changed since we last met. So if you're comfortable with doing extended by cubic uh, grid warps, but you don't want a whole face full of yellow spline points, which also just makes it confusing. If, and God forbid you, you know, turn off shape keying and go to individual uh, vertex tracking. You know, this is a good way to go. Well, uh, I have used a VGA size cutout here, and it does not need to be that. It can be any size that you want. Um, so I, I could have refined that even further, you know, over his face. It's just, you know, VGA is easy. It's a pop-up there. That's one of the virtues of uh, linking an axis position to a resize position. And, and by the way, you know, if you're working at 4K and you've got like maybe six of these layers that you want to mm, do some micromanaging on, it's actually going to save you some processing and uh, memory time to, you know, make a smaller crop w when you're in action it'll receive that as a VGA image and not you know, whatever it is you're working at, four or five, you know, some giant resolution. All right, so that that's, you know, one basic illustration of uh, linking two things together. Now I would like to talk about uh, this contraption that I have developed here. I'm going to turn that mat off. And what, so I've taken a, an old, well, not old, it wasn't that long ago. I've taken a previous demo that I did and I've color corrected it green so that we don't get this multiple repeating mirror in mirror Salvador Dali Dada thing going on, which is confusing in a bad way, believe me. So the two UIs won't conflict with each other. And I have created a setup. Specifically, I have a access called Cutout and this is cut out and he is linked to the resize position so wherever I move him like let's say right over the animation window here it, it will update if I sort of go forward and, and backward a frame and it'll basically chunk out this piece of image here I'm going to delete that key and turn this off because ah, well, we don't really need it yet on top of cutout, I have an access called scalar, which has all the math on it, which I'll show you in a second. I have a control access, which essentially acts like a slider in this giant contraption that 
does this. And I have a light and a shadow cast, you know, just to make it look a little bit nicer. So, wherever I move cutout here and update, and when I grab my control axis, it'll bring him up in Z and scale, uh, sorry, move him in X, Y at the exact same ratio so that they all kind of land in the same place, that is the center of your screen, at the same time. And, you know, this has potential uses for uh, sports footage, specifically, you know, if you wanted to highlight, like, a really nice interception or catch or goalie falling on his face or some kind of thing like that, you would just move that over there, zoom this in, talk about it for a bit, zoom it back out, you know, and then advance your frame and, and so on. So the key element to this machine is the expressions that are on the scalar uh, axis. Well, you know what? Here, let me talk about this for just a quick second. It's a little difficult to describe, and believe me, it took like a day to figure this out. But essentially, you know, as a conditional, when you move your control axis, it does a then, and your positive value is this business here, negative one times sine. Uh, this sine thing is pretty cool, actually. And that basically is a filter to determine, or actually to make it irrelevant, what quadrant you're in. So whether you're in a negative x or a negative y, cutout that is, whether cutout is in a negative x or a negative y, um, it'll always sort of give that the right sign of which to do the following math, which is to take a minimum of controls x position, which is your slider, divided by uh, 900 divided by absolute of cutout position x. And I'm trying to remember exactly what that does. That essentially gives you this 900 is important. That is your uh, z scale factor. And the absolute, which makes sense once this whole sign business is in, uh, the absolute of cutout positions x gives you uh, kind of the increments on which to move. And you take a minimum of that and cutouts position so it'll always move toward the center because your sign is corrected here and of course if nothing is happening to your control position just return zero it's not a very good description I realize but uh, I will put this in the comments of the video on Vimeo and you'll be able to cut and paste it right into your uh, access and it'll be easy when I say prototype I mean that this thing is set up uh, right now to, to do the X control I'll show you that in a sec. The z-axis gets a very much more simple version, uh, kind of the same thing as, as above, but it doesn't need to test whether it's negative or positive ahead of time. So it just returns a minimum of 900, which is your scale value, or controls position x. So as you slide it, it slides up until it hits 900, then it stops. Let's go back to the contraption itself and look at where these go. So I have made an access that I called scalar, and on that I have essentially put the uh, same expression that I just showed you with a lot of extra spaces and such to make it readable. Um, and that'll just be a basic uh, copy and paste for you guys. You know, unlike before where we had to go through the minutiae and details of these expressions, I just want to spit these out and get you going on this machine. And it's the same expression pasted in here, except all the control positions, are, of course, stay on X because that's essentially your slider. And all the cutout position values are turned into Y instead of X. So when you paste that in, you'll need to change those uh, three X values to Y values. And the Z value is exactly that. It doesn't change no matter what. That's pretty much all there is to it. Once you have that done, anytime you move this guy from a range of 1 to 900, it'll slide up whatever portion of the screen you have seen fit to zoom on, as I explained before. Okay, so that's kind of it, but one thing I want to, if we have time, to show you real quickly is that uh, since this small cutout, let me go back to the resize node, I have set this for what, 560 by 160 because it, it's kind of in the right place for highlighting an expression typing box. 
Uh, again, it could be any size that you want. And I think you might find that your zoom value, which is at the moment sort of hard coded in our expressions down here, um, will likely change in that if you're cutting out a large portion of the screen, you probably don't want to shove it too far into people's faces. So one thing you could do is in this action setup, um, create a new axis and call it something fun like Z zoom. And we can now substitute, let's say, this Z zooms position, which at the moment we will set for, let's say, 800. Now we can take the value of this X position and plop it in our expressions. If we go back to scalars position and hotkey to modify and take this 900 and turn it into a typo, turn it into Z zoom position X. Oh, I got that right. And I will go back and highlight that, hit control C a couple times, and go to the Y axis, edit the expression, select 900, replace it with zzoom.position x, and I will do the same on the expression that's on the Z axis. Control V, enter. Wow, nothing choked. How cool is that? So now, same thing will happen, except you might notice it's a little bit smaller. So if you move Z, uh, if you move Z, what's his name, up to like a thousand and do your control, you know, things get really big. So if you change the size of this, which you can do dynamically, but I do warn you that the resize node has a zero and one keyframe offset thing, which is kind of creepy. So if you decide to change the size of your crop box for whatever reason, you can also dynamically roll in the amount of zoom that you want. And I would put a constant uh, interpolation type on this cutout, by the way, so that everywhere you moved it, it behaved itself. Well, that's the uh, two examples of linking an access to a resize node. And I will thank you for watching and see you guys all on the other side.